It's usually warm this season, so it's good. Start out and I'll let out. Like, well, yeah, let me know. I hate this table. I never win here. And Brad's like, all right, you can break. And I, I scratched on the break on the right. first game. Yeah, that's, that's a sign. Couldn't do that if I tried. <laughs> it's going to be rough. Right. We have a food menu now, and it was like two varieties of hot pockets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I a think, Mama Celeste pizza. <laughs> like they turned the pandemic two days. So they were prepared. They were prepared. They already had food. <laughs> oh, it's starting to let you know. <laughs> yeah, let me check with our chef. Hey, uh, Chef Redenbacher. How much you longer on that popcorn? <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> For everyone joining us, we're just waiting for um, one more member of the BZA. So we have four, and we'll get started shortly.
violence. <laughs> it's, you know, the excitement of the series. Folks know we have the public hearing first. $3,000. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. Sixteen. How much time do we have for public? Two minutes, right? Two minutes. Yes. Three, yes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. That's a long since they've covered top. Yeah, we only have one person sign up, but mm -hmm. do you if there's others that show up that want? Yeah. Right. High school. Oh. Yeah. It's high school probably. I did a workshop the last time ago in high school. It right. got me interested. And then my uncle, who came with his awesome attorney. Oh, okay. So that was sort of influence. I was like being an advocate for him. It was primarily like to be an ass. He has to be on his side. I just found it interesting learning about your rights, being able to find folks. That was the main reason. No, of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, only work is like entertainment love, so copyright love to help other artists you know, for the contract and things like that. So it's starting to come full circle. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Really cool. Did you do it all in Milan? Yes, I did. Okay. Good. So did the city grab you right out of there, or did you go to uh, so first? I or clerking, or once I passed the bar, once I got sworn in, that guy ended up getting a job with Buckingham House. So work is coming. So, I was working on injury, the injury worker side, Sandra, the top pieces for three years. Yeah. But it was a very valuable experience, um, especially in like negotiating. I learned a ton. Very applicable for substitution. <laughs> this is where the action is. Yeah. You're in the right place. <laughs> you know, is it intense yeah. or less intense? You know, there's like oh, that's the, the, the so intensity. Wow. <laughs> it could be. No, I think it's right actually. I think it's yeah. down the hall. Yeah. 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 Be, if not, there's like like a pro athlete there, that level of excitement. That's stress. You know, the motion picture contracts. So my friend is uh, <laughs> a friend's cousin sports agent. I don't think like it's a professional level, but not like a star player. But even then it's just super stressful because it's like not it's not stop for a minute. Uh, we get you know trying to get endorsements and get offers and then these organizations like, they play hardball right, with these contracts. <laughs> he has a football, he had a Oh, man. So I forgot his name is, but he played for Miami, played for the Dolphins. Yeah. Yeah. One point. Years back, but like, he was telling me stories about <laughs> the meetings that I sit in, in terms of trying to get deals closed. And, yeah, and just tons. Right. It's good money, but it's like you have such a short one. period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's like you have like time and vacation to think of. <laughs> Sounds a lot less fun than land so, use. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like the yeah. yeah. person who's going to gain, obviously, that this person who would but constantly working. So they want to work life balance. The one person working a lot is the rat. The economy one? Yeah. I told Giselle the other day, I was like, yeah, you got to leave him. I really don't know. I'd probably be dead in those. Got the Tampa Bay. Yeah, just 
Yeah. And then the new Fox is giving them 300 million off, off the bat. I don't know why they still haven't gone to my people. Somebody said to him once you can. <laughs> You've been playing football since you know, kids' entire life. There's people on this team who could be the dad easily. Yeah. Easily. What the? Was it? Some ridiculous. Like some we're super busy. There's some, some stat with Tom Brady. The last time yeah. that happened, you know, with him. Yeah. Like Lamar Jackson, they're playing the Ravens. Lamar Jackson was five. <laughs> oh, was wow. That's <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> He's five. <laughs> I mean, I'm. Wow. He's, he's, uh, when you're older, he's 44. So other than that, like, he's like, he's like, he's holding it together, you know? Is he 45? He have to start 45. So old people like me, the back out, like, sneezing. <laughs> he's getting tired. He's getting tired. Let's go. Yeah. I give him credit. He has great stuff. Uh, why it's gonna close where at that point oh, we've done stop. everything you can possibly do as a quarterback. He did successfully. Mm-hmm. But they uh, just, just hang it up. Oh my god, he was there. I would have just hung, hung it up once and played his part of the back. Oh yeah. Right. We've been on no so we have who's that back? Brian Lee. Like, 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 like it's the channel they've known for so long. I feel like that's oh. part of it. It's like hard to it up. Um, Martin, um did you get a sense of how long was it was going to take because five I'm minutes. Thinking is, Serena went to pick her up. Oh, okay. So give it five more minutes. Okay. Because otherwise, we could just go back to originally doing the workshop uh, first. Yeah, but I, I, I would prefer that. I mean, I know quorum is required for workshops, but mm-hmm. it just feels wonky to me to have a workshop when I remember. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we can always move late, we just can't start early. <laughs> Quite to public notice. So. Once we get a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We have a little audience. It's like, where's my YouTube stream? Right? <laughs> no, we're, we're number four on Hulu right now. <laughs> Well, I want to get to number three. So. <laughs> yeah. Are you going in my direction again? What's up? I can go in my direction. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Happy to play, play practice my supper. Sounds an elf musical. Okay. Oh, it's fun. It's, yeah. Mm. Charlie, I don't know. Charlie. Crunch time. It's good to see you next month. Next month. Right. Yeah. It's cute. He has zero ambition. I was like, are you going to go out for play practice? He's like, yeah, I'm going to go out for a part. I was like, which part do you want? He goes, I'm thinking security guard number two. <laughs> I was like, you're not even going for security guard number one. You're going to the other unnamed characters. Well. He goes, yeah, you get, to, you get to throw them out of the building and say, you know, go back to whatever Santa land or something. I was like, that's <laughs> it's great. Good, good for you, son. Wait up. Way to be your own advocate. <laughs> Security guard number two. Oh, number two. That's what he got. Oh, no, he got this Charlie part. Oh, oh right. You don't have kids with ambitions to get speaking goals. <laughs> Sorry. I know you wanted to be on stage for six seconds, but I'm at line now. <laughs> you really got up. <laughs> Let it out. Yeah. 
That's us. Like, man, it's not exactly like the movie. And I'm like, how is it going to be? How is it going to be exactly like the movie? The movie. You know, they're going to have a flying sliding t shirt. It's just going to happen. This is not right. Like if there's a setting on here that says rude solo. <laughs> what that means. But... Maybe it's for like uh reggae music. What was the sound setting? Rude, rude solo. solo. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> great. He knows what you know what music. It's like guess what? Dude? I know what I'm gonna do. Rude solo. Yeah. Blinking, I don't know. We should oh, it's like the blinks. Like oh, I'm not sure. I just love how like for the meeting purposes. Yeah. Great soundboard. Yeah. You can literally control the time on this day. Jeez. It's the wires for me, though. <laughs> that is real, yeah. That's a good soundboard, though. I need a solo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It might have been isolated. It might have been isolated. Uh, the speaker isolated sound. Right? Uh, I think. No, I think it's kind of beginning. Yeah. Right, so let's just. Uh, Do you want to type in the chat? We're waiting on two members. If we weren't thinking they missed it. Yeah, it was a sound channel solo. Yeah. You know this song? <laughs> Ever called the doctor's office? <laughs> yeah. 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 They did a story on that. Oh my gosh. Sure. NPR did a story on it. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty funny. The guy who wrote it was in music yeah. school. He just did like a project, right? Oh. And he never he wanted to actually replace something else. But so a buddy is just like, hey, can you write any, anything, like any music that can buy from you? So I'm working on a phone system. And it's like we don't have any music in the public domain. So I bought it from the guy three hundred dollars. So we sold it. Uh, and the guy wound up selling this hold system software system. And they had like 75% of the contracts in the United States. Yeah. So literally what you hear. Yeah. So the guy is like, so I aspired my whole life to make music every day. Everybody would hear. But it's like the way it's like the twilight zone. They're hearing it and all of them are pissed off. <laughs> They're all mad. Right? It's like I finally made it as a musician. And I wrote the world's old music, but the, the story was because that um, people really like it. Yeah, it's actually like not bad. I remember that was the first time I was like, oh, it's like what? Yeah, it's totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
stream do it for you. Thanks. Are we live streaming? Yes. All right. So uh, let's get underway for the Wednesday, November 2nd Board of Zoning Appeals meeting. I apologize to those of you joining us remotely and those of you who have joined us in the room for the delay. Um, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, tonight's agenda had a slight switch from the one that was uh, sent out earlier in the week in which we've moved the public hearing for 64 Colvin Avenue to the top of the agenda. Um, this way we can work through some of those questions with the applicant before getting into the remaining cases uh, that are part of the public workshop. Um, just a little reminder about the structure of the meeting. Uh, for the public hearing session, we'll have the uh, applicant come up. Uh, staff will uh, present some of the facts about the case and get everybody on the same page as far as uh, the application materials. The board will have the opportunity to ask the applicant about the, the proposal. The applicant can walk it to the board through uh, the proposal before the board, at which time we'll have a little bit of back and forth I bet, with, with some questions. At that point in time, uh, we'll open it up to public comment. Uh, people from the public uh, either joining us remotely or here in person will have three minutes to speak. If there's more that you would like to provide, uh, please do so in a different method. Uh, sending us a letter is a great way to get all your comments in one place if you feel that uh, the three minutes is not uh, acceptable uh, format to be able to provide all your comments. Um, so I highly recommend if people want to submit uh, written comments, the board will entertain those as well. Um, with that, uh, the applicant can come back up and choose to rebut if there are questions or responses uh, to the public's comments about a particular project. Um, sometimes the, there is no public comment or it's in favor of a project. It's up to you on how much time you want to take in rebutting uh, that situation. Um, and at that time, the board may or may not uh, move forward with a particular application. Uh, unless we have any questions from our board members, I think we're all set to kick things off. So why don't we get started with 64 Colvin Avenue and if the applicant and the representative uh, would like to come up, we'd love to have you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, yeah, lights on, you're good. Uh, Andy Brick from the Brick Law Firm on behalf of the applicant for 64 Colvin. Thanks for joining us this evening. Would you like to walk us through the proposal? Sure. Um, it's somewhat of a unique circumstance. I, I, I don't think it's the type of application that you've seen before. Um, we're requesting a substitution of a non-conforming use, um, which is allowed uh, on, under the USDO. We currently um, have uh, four uh, non-conforming uses that, that are allowed on the property. And, and what we are proposing uh, in the most simple sense is to eliminate those four non-conforming uses uh, in exchange for allowing one non-conforming use to be substituted. The non-conforming use we're seeking to be substituted uh, would be internal uh, air control self-storage uh, in the existing building. It's 64 Colvin Avenue, uh, which is the Armory Garage property, and it's the Armory Garage building that we are attempting to uh, repurpose and reuse uh, with a use that, that we believe is less intense uh, than what's existed on the property for, for, for decades. Um, I can go through the PowerPoint uh, very briefly. Uh, this the, the property information um, and some pictures uh, of the existing conditions of the property. Uh, most people are familiar with the corner. It's a very visible corner and the building. Uh, the building has seen much better days. Uh, one of the aspects of our um, proposal is to really spruce it up and, and, and turn it into something that is attractive to look at when you drive by again, uh, not what, what's currently there now. Um, and, and those are just some views from some of the other, the, the car repair, as well as the car wash facility from, from the back side of it. And the section of the code uh, that I think we're gonna probably have a pretty deep discussion about tonight is, is this section, um, it's section 375-5064, which in essence allows for uh, this board to authorize the substitution of one non-conforming use to another, um, but there are specific criteria that you must apply. And, and, and those criteria primarily are that the, the proposed use to be substituted um, has to be in a less intense land use category and has to be a, a less intense use of the property. Um, I, I think we all agree from the work session as well as Commissioner Glass's memo um, that 
this isn't the most articulate section of the USDL. Um, it, it, it's a little bit confusing, but ultimately I think what it really boils down to is you can only consider a substitution if what's being proposed as the substitute is something that is drastically less intense than what's existing on the property. Um, th these are the current um, non-conforming uses on the property. Convenience retail um, isn't allowed to use in the zone, so we didn't even count that as a um, one of the non-conforming that was substituting, but we would give that up um, as an allowable use in, in exchange for the self-storage. But the other four on the vehicles and equipment are, are the car wash, the sales and rental, the servicing, uh, and the vehicle fueling station, which it was part of the, the convenience store. In exchange, we're proposing the commercial services category, uh, which is the self-storage facility. So the proposed use, going back to that definition, must be in a less intense land use category. Uh, within the USDO, and this was also uh, referenced in Commissioner Glass's memo to you, there's no specific definition of intense or intensity of use. So if I could play lawyer for a little bit, I put some cases up there that said that if there isn't a specific definition in the zoning code, um, a court or the ZBA uh, would, would look to the ordinary meaning of the term. Um, and, and so uh, both of those cases are, are local and, and are still good law here in the third department. So looking to the ordinary meaning, uh, went to where we, you would ordinarily go, to, to the Merriam-Webster. And, and, and the definition of intensity, the quality or state of being intense, especially the screen degree, strength, force, energy, or feeling. I think number two kind of fits a little bit more of what we're looking at. The magnitude of a quantity per unit, such as area, charge, mass, time, use would, would be our argument. So, um, we can demonstrate in, in, in all aspects that each of the um, aspects of the self-storage use are less intense than what currently exists on the property. Uh, we, less traffic. The, we have four existing non-conforming uses, so we, we aggregate the traffic resulting from all four of them to, to see what the, the, the current traffic is. And, and the current traffic, just for the car wash, the, um, the, the convenience of the gas, the gas and the sales of the cars would generate 184 trips per PPM hour. Uh, self storage would generate 11 trips per PPM So So we clearly are um, sufficiently, significantly less with traffic. Uh, with parking, um, I had my paralegal uh, try and count the parking spaces on the site plan. Anyone that's familiar with the property, it's all parking. Yeah. Um, I told her to stop at 300 because her eyes were, were getting crossed. Um, there are over 300 uh, parking spaces on the property. Um, your code, uh, the, the USDO, requires for the self-storage use that, that we are proposing uh, one spot for each 5,500 square feet of both floor area. That means we are required to, under the code, to provide 11 parking spaces. So there's 300 on the property. We're required to provide 11. We probably end up when the site plan gets finalized and providing about 20, still significantly less. Um, lighting, the site is, as most people know, completely paved and completely lighted, both for security and aesthetics. There are rows of um, ornamental fixture type street lights, but they were really for security for the, for the cars that were stored there, the for sale cars. And then there are some spotlights out by Central Ave pointing back again for security. Um, that could be significantly reduced because one of the benefits of our proposal is that we're seeking to reduce the footprint of what's going on in the property just to the building itself with some limited parking around. So we can give up all that lighting outside and we can give up the, the impervious surface. We don't need that, that sea of asphalt anymore um, for this particular use and any subsequent uh, development plan because if this substitution is granted, we still have to go to the planning board for a major development plan review. Um, so any plan that would be submitted would clearly show the reduced lighting and reduced impervious surface because it, it's not necessary. Yeah. It's necessary if we keep the car sales because you need to store the cars there and display them. Not needed for internal storage. Um, less structures, uh, we are proposing to remove the gas canopy. Uh, it's no longer needed. It is somewhat of a large canopy um, next to the building, but it's not needed for self-storage, so, so that's being proposed to be removed. Are the uh, tanks themselves being removed as well? Correct, yes. Yes, they are. 
Um, less signage. If, if, if you visited the site in advance of this meeting, which I suspect you may have, there's directional signs all over the place. Service here, car wash here, the, the mobile sign for the gas, all of that um, is no longer necessary for self-storage. It's, you know, put a sign on the side of the building, everyone's going to see it. Um, less refuse. I, I provided this picture because I was surprised to, when I visited the back of the property. There are currently nine dumpsters. Um, in the back corner of the property up against the, the park. That's that's the park up behind that hill. Um, and with, with self-storage, uh, I, I would submit that the number of the outside dumpsters would be zero. Um, we have, uh, we store our files in the, in the value space, which is across the street on uh, uh, over next to Price Shopping. And, and I was over there today and they show no dumpsters outside. I suspect they probably have some type of refuse container in one of their storage units that they open and wheel out. Um, but we would be outside one at tops, but probably we could include it inside like, like value space cuts. So I think significantly we that reduced from, from nine dumpsters uh, to, to one um, or, or zero. Less water use and less sewer use. Um, I, I have some um, documents for you that um, the, the federal government says that um, federal employees in, in offices utilize 50, the average is 15 gallons of water per day per employee. Um, we are significantly reducing the number of employees uh, in its heyday when, when in the 90s when it was really kicking over there with the restaurant Yano's. It was really it was an interesting place. They had about 200 people uh, working there full part time. Now um, they have significantly less than that. Um, but the the, the, the car sales operation that had moved, has moved next door, they have 50 employees. So if we were to keep the car repair and car sales, we have about 50 employees. Um, with self storage, uh, the maximum you would see at any given time in the building would be three employees. Usually it's one, sometimes it's two, sometimes with a janitorial. Um, so it, it would be three tops. So less employees, less water use, less water use, less sewer use. Uh, like, less electric use because we'd be removing all that lighting outside. And also um, the current electrical system was from when the building was built. I'm sure it's not efficient. Um, the the self-storage would have you know, efficient, uh, up-to-date uh, electric systems, which if you've ever been in self-storage, the, the lights are off until you go in the hallway or go in your unit and then they come on automatically. So it would also result in, a, in, in less electric use. So those are just some examples of how we would be significantly less intense on, on the property. Um, I would also add, um, I mean, we really drilled down uh, to the point that we would require less bicycle parking than, than the existing uses. And, and it is a requirement in your code, as I'm sure you know, that to provide bicycle parking spaces, we, 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 would, we would require three, uh, which is half of what would, would be required now by the existing uses. So, so we really did look at all, all aspects of it. So this is where it gets a little more interesting. This is the, 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 the language from that section itself that it's allowed in all zones with the same or fewer conditions. Um, so in all the zones where self-storage is allowed, in all the zones where the current um, non-conforming uses that are in place are allowed, there are supplemental regulations in the USDO. Um, and, and so the U for, for self-storage, there are five supplemental regulations that must be followed for all self-storages in all zones. Uh, for the combined non-conforming uses, there's a total of 14 supplemental uses. And I didn't want to put it all on a, um, on, on a uh, PowerPoint, so I did just provide copies of the supplemental regs for each of the, the uses that proposed as well as the existing. So clearly just numerically, you know, five is less than 14. So, so we would meet that just, you know, on its face. However, when you look at the specific conditions, the, the regulations for self-storage are significantly um, less stringent and, and fewer than what's required for the other existing uses. They're primarily related to keeping everything inside, which is what we're going to be doing. This is not an outside facility. It's going to be completely uh, inside and climate controlled. So uh, meeting those five supplemental regulations won't be difficult for us at all. Didn't want to present this without taking a look at that Albany 2030 uh, and, and seeing what, whether or not we run afoul of anything there. We, 
do or it supports what we want to do. And when, when you read the comp plan, you see pretty quickly that the idea of reuse, repurpose, uh, rehab, uh, adaptive reuse is found throughout. I just I just gave some examples of where, the, where it's mentioned in strategies and, and intermediate um, activities to be conducted. And, and that's what we're proposing. We are trying to reuse that existing building. That building is 60,000 square feet. Um, my original uh, application said 40 was a typo. It's 60,000 square feet. And there's not much you can do with it. Um, we've, we've, we think we found a use that is compatible for the area, is much less intense, and will effectively utilize the 60,000 square feet. Um, it, it, will, it will be a business, it will generate you know, income for the economy, it'll pay taxes. It's a good use for the building there. It's less intense than, than what currently exists. And we think that this is a good idea from a practical standpoint. But you have to look at it not just from a practical standpoint, but you have to apply the test that exists in the code, as well as you have to look at what's in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the city. So I think, and, and you also have to be respectful of the precedents that you set by taking your actions. Every action you take arguably has a precedent. Um, in this instance, because of the unique circumstances of all of the particular characteristics that exist on this site, I would argue that the presidential value of granting this substitution would be exceptionally limited. Um, in the MUCU, we have seven acres with an existing 60,000 square foot building with multiple active non-conforming uses. And the building's already lo partially located in the district where self-storage is permitted. Um, about 12 to 15% of the actual building structure is located in the uh, MU community highway which is the, the zone right next door. Um, if this building was one property over, we'd be in allowable use. So due to those circumstances, we think there's very limited presidential value to approving this substitution because no other property is gonna come in with that set of facts. Um, so we think it, it, it's a good idea to do. Um, we think that it'd be less intense for the property, it will look better aesthetically. People will be happy to drive by and not see that sea of pavement anymore with, with all the cars out there and, and, and the building that's coming down, you know, falling down around it. Um, and I recognize that self storage was allowed in this zone until December. So you probably have the question, well, if the city council in less than a year ago took self-storage out of this zone, what right do we have to approve something that puts it back in? And I, I understand the question, but what I would submit is that they took self-storage out as an allowable use in the MUCU zone throughout the city. It wasn't specifically to this particular property. Um, perhaps if they looked at the unique characteristics of this property, they may, may have revisited whether or not MUCU is appropriate uh, on this property to begin with, uh, and whether or not community highway was a little more appropriate, but, but, but that's, that's under the bridge. But what they did do is they took self-storage out of the MUCU, but they've kept in the code your ability to substitute non-conforming uses. That's a, that's a legislative recognition that the idea of getting rid of some more intense non-conforming uses in exchange for something that's less intense, even if it's self-storage, is a good idea. I, I, conceivably, I could come in here tonight and make an argument that a crematorium on this property would be a less intense use be, based upon what's there now. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. Here, self-storage is a good use of the building. It, 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 it's less intense. It's a good substitution because, as you know, the theory behind zoning when it comes to grandfathered uses and non-conforming uses is that they're supposed to get reduced and eventually extinguished. And, and you're performing that by, by reducing four of them, converting four of them down to one, which is less intense than the other four, you're achieving those goals. I think the, the key to your analysis is whether or not the non-conforming use is less than what's existing, which, which I, I've demonstrated. Um, the facts are unique, so there's limited precedential value. And although this is kind of an eyeball request and it's not something you hear every month, we think we meet the facts to justify you 
exercising your authority to substitute uh, the non-conforming use. I, I would also add that if you, right now you don't have a plan in front of you. you we haven't done a site plan because we don't know what the design because we don't know if you're gonna authorize the substitution. If you authorize the substitution, our next step would be the planning board for major development review. Um, so we would uh, put on the record here that we would submit to the planning board a, 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 plan, a site plan that achieves a reduction in all of those uh, aspects of use that we had put forth, I think it was on slide nine, that as a condition of approval, we would consent to that. Our application is going to come in and we're going to be able to demonstrate a reduction in all of those to the planning board. Well, certainly for some of those elements like the parking and landscaping, lot coverage, you'd have to come back here if they weren't compliant with sure. the site plan review. Sure, correct, correct. And, and, and also, I would add that we would agree to um, any substitution not becoming effective until we submit to, to you or the Commissioner uh, of Planning an affidavit from the property owner stating that all of the existing non conforming uses have terminated. We're not looking to start to sell storage, but keep the gas sales. We're not looking. So, so what, what we would propose is a condition of the approval that the substitution would not be effective until an affidavit confirming from the property owner that all of the uses have terminated was submitted to the city. We, we have no problem doing that. And I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, that would probably requires some coordination as far as the clock, because I know we have a built-in, we have a baked-in clock when grandfather's use, when that use is out, it's no longer grandfathered for a period of time. Correct. So we want to make sure to carefully pay attention to that. And, and basically, primarily it would be, I'm keying it from the December date when they passed the new um, zoning code last December. So we, we are under the gun to either keep our non-conforming uses or, or lose them. Mm -hmm. um, our plan would be to uh, be able to submit that um, affidavit that all uses has ceased termination by the end of the year. Yeah. So we, did see, we did see an affidavit that the uses are currently in effect, to some degree. Yes, at the bar. And, and that affidavit is from Joe Kramer, who apparently everybody in the city of Albany except me knows. Um, he's he's been the property manager there for for decades, and so uh, and so he, and he says, yeah, that, that's all been going. For. The one thing he didn't mention is, is, is the convenience retail, but that's a permitted use. So that's, that's why it doesn't matter with that because that's permitted. That's not one of the not for. <laughs> Do you have any questions from the board members before I jump in? No, just jump right. Okay. Um, so as you're aware, when, when the board is reviewing applications before us, and you had sort of alluded to the fact that we're always looking to extinguish non-conforming uses or, or build towards a transition of something compliant with existing regulations. Um, I, I'm curious, you did submit a letter uh, at, uh, from uh, Tri Capital Realty about exploring options for conforming uses for the, for the parcel. I'm just curious, as far as the record goes, uh, what other attempts have been made, if there have been, as far as developing the parcel in a way that would conform with something? Sure. So my client is one of the um, best well-known property developers here in Capital District. Um, the Burke companies has been to have been, been developing commercial and residential properties for close to 50 years uh, in the Capital Region. Um, and, and they've looked at this every, every which way uh, possible. The problem is that to, to develop in compliance with the current zone, you have to demo the building because the building is not, the current zone requires everything up closer to the street. So the, 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 the building would have to go. The estimates they're getting is seven to $900,000 to demo that building. Um, so any development that you're gonna do starts with that negative number. And that's what's making it cost prohibitive to, to, to comply with the zone. Um, so, when, when you're looking at a $900,000 cost to knock something down just to start brand new, clearly, common sense dictates you look to reuse the building. Save the $900,000, reuse the building. So that's where that's where the focus went to pretty quickly when we got those demolition estimates. Can you talk a little bit about, if we can go back to the slide with the overview of the building, um, the satellite photo, just to define the site parameters so we have the, we have the building, uh, the lighter colored roof is the repair area. Could you walk us, so I realize this is all preliminary, walk us through the portions of the site that will be accessed for you know people dropping things off, the, those sorts of elements of the use of the property? Sure, um, and, and it's from the, where the entrance is now on the bottom, towards the bottom left of that picture, I guess it would be the south, mm -hmm. what's coming in there, the entrance is good, would be there. 
and it would be towards the front of the building, right where the arrow is now. And there would, in that area, there would be some uh, parallel parking areas, which uh, would be large spots, you know, some the U haul and things like that. Like that. And, and, and the main door would be right there. And then everything else would be accessed internally. I think they are looking, and it's very preliminary. Um, but they are looking at the idea of saving some of the overhead doors on the on the far west side um, for some type of large scale inside storage, uh, so that so they have an alternative, you know, roll up door that they can utilize if necessary. But the general idea is is the front there now on the left in that in that area is going to be to pull up and and unload and, and load in if you. If you've ever been to value space um, over across the way, it's it, it would be similar to that. In, you go around the back, and then there is the the, the canopy and the large canopies the trucks coming underneath, and then the, the doors that you access with your code. That there would be a similar thing in this location here. Is there any vehicle storage, or is it all? I don't believe it's vehicle storage. I believe it's all anticipated to be, you know, units. They, can, they cut it up into the units, and then you, you know, you get a padlock, you put it on, and you keep your, your stuff in there. It doesn't fit your house. And none of it's outside. It's all, all inside. I don't have any additional questions. You guys want to turn over? You, you mentioned that there were three hundred, around three hundred parking spaces, and that with this, with your current plans, you wouldn't need that amount of parking spot spaces. What were you planning? What are the plans with regard to the current parking spaces? Are they going to be moved or transformed in some way? I think, and we've committed to this evening to reduce the impervious space. Um, I would strongly suspect knowing the planning board um, when we submit for a development plan review, they are not going to approve us and let the sea of asphalt stay there. Um, so we, we've already been in the process of, of working on that. Also, because in effect, what we're doing is pulling the footprint in. We don't need all of that exterior space as a result of the self storage. We need the building and we need maybe 20 spots around um, and with a couple of entrances and, and exits. So that also gives us the ability to look at utilizing other portions of the property for compliant uses. And, and that would have to come for development review. And clearly, it's not going to stay as the sea of that that's pretty much a given. Uh, let's see if uh, let's let's um go to public comments. So then, thank you. We may call you back. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we'll be done. Um, so just I want to clarify that the intensity, like yeah, you know, I appreciate mm -hmm. your going through all the different elements of how the. This use could be less intense. Mm -hmm. But I think wait, the second sentence goes into defining that and it really links, and even in the first sentence of the section, it really links the intensity with the land use categories based on the table. So I don't know that what I mean, yeah, I appreciate the, mm -hmm. but I don't know that that's what's intended exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean. It's not irrelevant, but I don't know that that's what's meant here so much as going back to the table and comparing, you know, with the table, land use categories, and right. in that context. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and I understand your question, and, and I agree with you. So um, I, I, think, <laughs> I think at the work session, that the chairman had mentioned that the language in this section is a little wonky. This is cool. um, if you look at Commissioner Glass's memo, he says it's he's he's very diplomatic. He says there's a <laughs> lack of clarity. Um, I, I I think it, it, it's a little bit confusing at best. Um, but if you focus on the categories itself, I don't think that was the real intent of, of the city council because I can make an argument if you if you just work from the presumption, the standard presumption that an industrial use is more intense than a residential use. I can defeat that argument very easily with self-storage as an industrial use on this property versus this property with uh, 20 duplexes. 20 duplexes, which are, are allowed, um, 
would be significantly more intense than a self-storage in terms of all of those elements because of the amount of people it brings in, the amount of traffic, the amount of parking it's required. So I don't think the proper analysis is looking at the categories because self-storage, although it's an industrial use, is less intense than convenience retail, which is a retail use, or, or 20 duplexes, which is a residential use. So that traditional analysis of industrial is far more intense than residential or commercial, I don't really think applies. Well, to be fair, though, when the council was scripting that table, they did allow residential development in that zone. Correct. That would be, a, even though it is more intense, the number of trips required, they clearly had some thought to be, well, we want, we want mixed use uh, and uh, residential development in that area. We have everything within walking distance of that, that parcel, so. Correct, uh, and, and I agree. Um, but I think, and, and, and Commissioner Glass mentions this in his memo about which of the land use category, which he calls them tiers. Is it commercial versus industrial? Is it vehicles and equipment versus commercial services, which is where he landed on it? Um, or is it automobile wash, light vehicle servicing, vehicle fueling station versus self-storage. Um, I think in tier two or tier three, as he describes it, we're still less intense. And then, yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with how he, he script, how he put together the memo and walked us through uh, his department's view on that. And ultimately, I suspect the legislative intent is to allow you to substitute, which by the way, is voluntary. The city council is not required by law to provide a substitution section. They're, they're, they chose to do that, um, but they conditioned it upon the intensity. And I think it's clear, no matter how you read that, you as the board can't substitute something that's more intense, no matter how you read it. And, and, and I think where our self-storage is clearly less intense. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions from the board for the public? So just to just to finish on that. So you explained to us before how it was less intense. And then if we're looking at the table, it's still less intense or same. If you're looking at like right, we're looking at this table, yeah. the shortened table of the relevant sections of the yeah. table, we're, we're looking at MUCU, MUCH, right? And yeah. if we look at the tier three as mm -hmm. um, planning there to put it so like automobile wash weight vehicle sales or rental weight vehicle servicing vehicle station self-storage facility um there's no you know nothing for a much and then it's conditional permitted permitted nothing for a much for the vehicle right. functions and then it's permitted for self like so it would your claim be that even if you're looking if you're interpreting the that section to say that's how you should be looking at intensity. Yes. That it still meets the standard. Um, Cor correct. As or at least, yeah, the same or less intense. Correct. Because it just by way of example, convenience retail, which is permitted and, and which we, we um, had on the site, um, is clearly a more intense use when you look at, for example, traffic. It's 49 trips in the PPM for a convenience retail. Uh, self storage is 11 trips based upon the size of the buildings. So even though it's retail and it's allowed, the self-storage, which isn't allowed and we're requesting a substitution for, is still less intense than what's already allowed in some. And I think we need to, the, the global view, I, I think is what's important, that from a practical standpoint, self-storage building, internal self-storage, not junk all over the yard, junk in your car, an internal climate control self-storage building at that, at that property, is a far better use in terms of everything from intensity to aesthetics than, than what currently exists. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for flushing out this presentation with the additional information. I think that's very helpful. And if you'll allow me, I, I think I have a bit of a hypothetical. But if this substitution is allowed, is it the intent of uh, the applicant that this, that what the substitution will remain the primary use of this structure for the time being. Um, I, I know because we kind of mentioned a bit with parking that there might be other uses, but is it is the intent? Yeah. So let me be clear. And at first, thank you for the opportunity. I am a zoning nerd. I like <laughs> <laughs> um, the use 
of the structure will be and remain solely internal climate controlled cell storage. The, the building will not change. You allow a substitution, the building is going to be cell storage, and that's it. By allowing the substitution, it what I, I kind of it constricts the, the necessary footprint for the cell storage and opens up the possibility of additional uses on the larger seven acres. But the structure itself, self-storage all day, that's it. All right, thank you. And I think one thing that, that we were cautioned from staff is that if we were to consider alternative uses for uh, to this proposal on this parcel, like parking for something else, mm -hmm. that might be considered segregation because we're ultimately allowing a substitution of use and uh, uh, the, an, another proposal to move into that consideration. Yeah. Okay. Since you're a zoning nerd, <laughs> then I'll, I'll ask you, there's some opponents have said that this project would be going from one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use, albeit less intense, mm -hmm. when that's not the goal, the goal is conforming. So what is your response to that? It, I understand the argument, but we're not going from one non-conforming use to another. We're going from four non-conforming uses um, that candidly has a pretty intense use of the property when they're up and running to one. So we're already reducing it for four. So you could take credit saying we just we went from four to one. So that's progress. The theory behind uh, non-conforming uses in zoning jurisprudence is their eventual elimination, but not their immediate elimination. So it's progress. Going from four to one, and the one is less intense, is progress and an appropriate reason to have a substitution section to begin. Uh, I have one more question. Um, I, I know Martin asked a little bit about tanks and whether you were planning to remove them, stuff like that, and with all the, the vehicle links, um, you know, you said at the property, I'm assuming you had some environmental review oh, yeah. done and that there's this lease involved and there's enough plans. Um, so, so my client is in contract to purchase the property. We'll be closing very shortly. This one. Um, he didn't even want to get involved without a significant environmental review because you, we, everybody knows there's been auto repair there, oil changes for 50, 60 years. Um, there's gas sales. Um, the condition of entering into the contract that my client directed me to negotiate was to tell the current owner's attorney that during our due diligence period, he is going to he needs to be authorized to poke holes wherever he wants on that property and see what's in there. And it's what he did. Um, we had, I think, close to 100 test points throughout the property. And we used Labella Associates, uh, who's one of the best in the business. And their ge geologist came back and said, the property is clean. Um, you, you, it's safe for you to buy it. And, and, and we wouldn't even be here if, if he hadn't gotten that answer. Now, I know from experience that sometimes when you pull tanks up, some things show up and the, the, the land around it may, you know, have there may be a leak, there may be, but he's gonna he's gonna pull the tanks subject to DEC oversight and their permit. So if anything is found when they come up, it's gonna be remediated. And, and my client is assuming that responsibility. Uh, you said the cell is uh, had any time. Is our decision any impact on that or no? That's good. So that will move to the public uh, comment portion sure. of the hearing. Appreciate your time. Sure. May I invite you back up for rebuttals? Okay. Uh, why don't we start with people in the audience first? Thank you all. Thank you. So we just have uh, one member signed up, um, Mr. O'Brien. Mr. O'Brien, come on down. Thank you both. I'm going to talk and I do some hands. Okay. Thank you. I just did, did, um, did a copy of this go to staff for inclusion of public record. That one. I saw this letter. Yeah. But the other materials? No. Okay. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
one more. Can we get a copy of whatever? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. This, I don't believe that's going to understand. Okay, uh, my name is Michael Bryant. I am an officer in the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association and a former 12th Ward Council where this project is located. Uh, what I'm going to do, I was hoping I would actually have a written communication from the board of the uh, Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association. But what I have instead is uh, a a text copy, which I'm going to read, and it's to the zoning board, <clears throat> as stated today, regarding this project. And it says, uh, before the board is a request for substitution, citing the same sections that Mr. Kirk is citing, legal non-conforming uses to allow for the substitution of four prior legal non-conforming uses with a different non-conforming use of self-storage facility. We, the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association, represent the neighborhood and local business owners in that card. We, Iwana, have substantial questions regarding the proposed rezone for the following reasons. One, the Burke Development Corporation has not contacted or provided any planning proposal to Iwana, the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association. What is the structure going to look like? How will lighting impact the neighborhood? What will the streetscape now become? Now, I realize Mr. Burke tonight explained that that's in the work to explain why, and I, and I accept his explanation. Uh, two, the Chino Development Group has contacted the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association in regards to 60 Colvin Avenue and has recorded an option to buy a portion of 64 Colvin Avenue for a 190 unit complex on that property. This gets to, I thought, the most important thing that Mr. Burke said uh, to us tonight. He said they're looking to utilize other portions of 64 Colvin Avenue for compliant uses. Now, we didn't even know about his proposed conversion of uh, this building to uh, self storage until the notice went out on your website. The CEO contacted us in the spring, making it sound in any way like they were in active negotiations with uh, the Burke Corporation to put 190 apartments behind the building. Now, it, and, and we take them seriously. Now, if this happens, they're going to be right back in front of you with another non-conforming use, namely that the zoning code says that, you know, the residences are supposed to be streetscaped and the very rudimentary drawings. I have never, I, I, I gave you a copy of a letter that the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association sent to Pacino back in May, and they have never answered it. But in my conversations that I have with Brad Glass, they are definitely communicating with Burke and definitely communicating with the planning staff here to uh, feel out and make application for a 190 unit apartment complex behind those buildings. Now, I will agree with Mr. Brink that his proposed use of this as a internal storage unit is a much less impactful use than what it used to be. I don't think there's any argument with regard to that. But the key thing, which I think we need to focus on, and it's going to take more than tonight to do that, is that that the thing that Mr. Burke characterized as utilizing other portions of 64 Cobb Avenue. 
while the compliant use behind that building of 190 apartments is not a compliant use, if indeed we're to take the Chino seriously. And that's why I'd like to have a conversation directly with uh, Mr. Burke's representative uh, to see how much of what Pacino has been telling us is true. Because that is the real form in all the argument. Uh, I want to continue this reading, this communication from, from uh, the other officers. Um, okay. Uh, Burke developed. Burke Development has not provided the totality of use and intensity of use to Ioana for this property. If the property is intended to be subdivided for self storage facilities and other uses, shouldn't a seeker review be required now? Isn't that segmentation if you're proceeding with this use, which in itself, just that building does not appear to be impactful? I mean, I, I would have to admit that. Uh, but shouldn't, isn't this a segmentation? Because my understanding is there's also another lot, which I believe is 944 Central Avenue, which is way up in the corner of Alvin and, uh, Alvin and Central. And that there's been talk about converting that into a drive through fast food restaurant, which I think is something that the Burke Corporation does do. Because I'm aware that they own a number of Dunkin' Donuts with drive through fast food components. So there's a lot going on that doesn't meet the eye, which is impactful. And if that's the case, I think we shouldn't segment one by one by one the least impactful uses first, and then somehow two more in the others. If I can just finish reading the uh, letter that you're going to receive in writing from uh, the Neighborhood Association. Um, playing, uh, oh, we, we have been told by, by Brad and by Vecino that uh, they have conveyed to Brad, as well as to Housing Community Renewal Corporation, that uh, the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood, Neighborhood Association is on board with the Vecino proposal. That is not true at all. In fact, they never answered our letter for details. And they just gave us, you know, quick snow job, of, this is what we want to do. And by the way, they conveyed to us that it's like, a, you know, showing up deal. It's Burke Corporation. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I just want to finish out this. This communication, which you will get in writing, but since put on, on paper, we therefore respectfully request that this substitution of deal be delayed. We hope that the board gathers more information from Burke Development and encourage Burke Development to reach out to the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association so a fully informed opinion can be discerned. Thank you for consideration of this request and your work to, to create compatible land uses ensure proper design and promote the overall public good. Sincerely, the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association Executive Committee. So that's the sum and substance of what I have to say. Um, you know, I don't take issue with most of what has been said. It's definitely a less impactful use than the history of the property, but I am afraid what, you know, when the other shoes start falling, and particularly since Machina wants to come right back to you for a non conforming use, I think the council, and I was on the council, <laughs> I think we put some thought process into street, streetscape housing, and they're going to come back to you. And because the way you are one of the most basic concepts that was woven into this whole property. And I hope if they come back to you, they're dealing in much better faith with you when they dealt with us. We appreciate your comments. And thank you very much. Um, and if you would, if you can, and I would very much like to talk to. I'm sure he'll talk to go back to life. But I think and that's I like to talk to him later on too. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Sir, no. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see what that happens. It's close to that. Secret holder. No. Look good. I think we.
completely understand that. <laughs> but maybe, maybe. Okay. <laughs> uh, does the applicant want to back down? Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Hold on one sec. Do we have anybody online? I forget the uh, universe outside of this room. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. <laughs> So, appreciate council member, former council member Brian's comments. Um, I was pleased to hear that he agrees that self storage is less than 10 shoes, not a bad idea. Um, I would also add that the correspondence from the neighbor that you have um, also says, hey, this isn't such a bad use of the property. And her concerns are uh, much like uh, Mr. O'Brien's, as well as apparently the associations, is well, what else is going to happen? And, and whether or not we're segmenting the seeker. Um, there is the possibility that um, affordable housing uh, would be applied for on a portion of the property if it was no longer needed for car sales, display, and storage. Um, there is the possibility, um, and Vecino Group uh, is, is, I don't represent them, um, but, but they, they do have an interest in the property and they may, I can't say they won't, they may pursue uh, an application to either you or the planning board for affordable housing. But all of it stems, all of it flows from the substitution to the self-storage. Because in the absence of the substitution, there is no property for them to pursue an application because the property would remain as part of the car sales and repair. So everything that's going to happen on the site flows from the substitution. Um, I also, I, again, I don't represent them, I can't speak for them, but I, I would suspect that they wouldn't want to propose something that looked at the back of that building as is, or looked at the back of that building as a car repair and sales facility. So I think, I would suspect they're waiting to see if it's going to become self-storage uh, as well. Um, again, can't speak for them. Uh, I can confirm that there is the possibility that they may seek some type of application um, if the self-storage is granted, because then that, that section of the property would no longer be required for that, the car repair and sales. But I, I do want to reiterate, what's before the board tonight is a review of a conversion of substitution, a, a review of the substitution of four non-conforming land uses within that a structure absolutely. to sell storage. Correct. There are a lot of hypotheticals out there, but Correct. what's before us is an application and, for... And, 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 and candidly, we wouldn't be opposed to you know, coming in for, for affordable housing in that area with a plan that worked and was compliant. Um, we would recommend to them that come in with something that meets the code. That the city council spent a lot of time you know, uh, debating the USDR. Um, so, uh, and we have no objection to it. We would recommend they come in and comply. In, in terms of Seeker, and, and I'll, I'll speak to Mr. O'Brien, and the reason we haven't reached out to the association. I and mean, I, I had articulated this to staff is we don't have anything to show them. Um, I think the worst thing I could do is ask to be invited to their meeting and show up and say, well, we want a substitution and here's the, the legal, you know, mumbo jumbo on what we got to meet for a substitution, but we don't have a plan to show you. It's not effective. Um, if the substitution is granted, um, a plan will be developed and we have no problem presenting that even before we come back to the city presenting it to the association because we would much prefer to have the association on the board going in with the application uh, for whatever is going to happen uh, with our self storage. I can't speak to the casino. That's not, um, you know, I, I don't represent that. But I also, that's not before us. Correct. Absolutely. And in terms of seeker, um, segmentation is, is always a potential issue, but segmentation is never an issue for the first application in. Um, segmentation would become an issue that would need to be addressed by the second application that comes in. Um, and segmentation is um, under the secret regulations. It's stated that it's not preferred. In certain instances, segmentation, if it's justified by the applicant, can be the course of action under the secret analysis. But I would submit that the segmentation analysis isn't an issue for this board this evening because we're the only thing, we're, we're the only application. So segmentations. Never an issue when you're the only game in town. And right now, we're the only game in town. If Casino comes in with something down the road, they're going to have to address the segmentation issue. Uh, did you want to opine on that since you produced a great staff memo for us? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, as uh, city staff and um, consulting with the Corporation Council as well, have determined that it's not segmentation under Seeker. Um, now, essentially, it's because this is the only application that 
has formed into submission for the city. The other projects that were raised are still conceptual. They might not happen at all. Um, they could change completely in, in a lot of various ways. Um, and to add to that, it's also what we have tonight is, is uh, functionally independent from the other applications. So, um, you know, just looking under the secret guidelines, secret handbook, and um, the New York codes, rules, and regulations that addresses it, it's not, uh, does not meet the standards for our segmentation. Thank you. And, and generally, it would just be considered a type, type two action. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's what we're here for. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I refresh our seeker then. So I understand it's not an issue segmentation right now, like you're saying it's an issue for second application. And so if it was determined when potential second application came in, and then the board is looking at it, and it's like, well. You need to look at the seeker and not just alone this project, but the overall property that can be addressed by just saying that. Right yes, what, what would happen, but not to speak for Avi, I'm sure he knows this as well, but what, what would happen is when, when, when a sec, second application does come in, um, whatever board that's before, whether it's you or the planning board, would have to analyze for potential impacts to include whatever this board approves in terms of substitution. So the next applicant in can't say, ignore the self-storage because that's already approved. No, for the secret analysis of the next step in the application process has to incorporate analysis of the impacts resulting from the self-storage use. I think if it's just the planning board and the agency, I mean, we can about this project, but it would be working through that process. Yeah, the segmentation would typically be occurring if one were attempting to avoid having to do a larger environmental analysis. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Murray, if you or, or Abby, if you could just, I guess, further clarify for me. So with this application for a substitution, we are considering substitution of a non-conforming use for the structure itself and not necessarily property right and, and the, the development review process would iron out the site plan uh lot coverage conformity with things like screening buffers lighting fire extinguishing, um stormwater management on the site but we're looking at our our purview is solely the use of the property but i think what you're getting to is that these other potential uses like are not what we're looking at. Like what we're looking to substitute really what you're saying Correct. is like yeah. for, exactly. for potentially residential, like yeah. commercial, whatever, which is not um the self-storage star. Yeah. <laughs> um but I think I think you've got a good point. We're looking at critical property, but I think the other ones are already permitted or maybe need or maybe residential refer maybe they would need a certain type of variance yeah. because maybe they're not on the street or whatever. Okay. But like I think because they're a permit, like I think if they were trying to get a non-permitted use additionally on the property, then they would need to come back to us. Yeah. Right. Okay. And just just, just, sense, just yeah, to be clear, we're seeking approval of the substitution, giving up the four existing non-conforming uses on the entire property in exchange for internal self-storage in the building with incidental parking around is, is all we're seeking. And then potentially whatever else is permitted yes. on the rest of the well, that's for another. Right. Yeah. That's what it's like. Okay. Yeah. To clarify, the USDO has several <clears throat> items under non-conforming, and that includes non-conforming uses specifically, which is what we're referring to. There's non-conforming um, lots, there's not conforming signs, but we're we're not talking about this, the standards in terms of setbacks, landscaping, or any of those elements. We're just talking about the use. Yeah. But it doesn't limit the whole property to being self-storage facility. It's I think correct. Like yeah, correct. Yeah. If there's another use that's permitted under under the ordinance, you'd be allowed to, to do that. Or if there's a conditional use permit, you'd have to go through it. You know, through those legal standards. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
bit more time. Do we want to have any motions to the board? Well, I think we're expecting a written letter from. Uh, the yeah, um, <coughs> I was hoping to have it tonight, but you will be getting a written letter from the board at the Iwana. And I do want to talk. I mean, the Iwana wants to hear something. Is the Chino giving us accurate information? Have they, are they in? Is the sale effective for the Chino? I'm, I'm just going to, a little, uh, maybe partially out of order, but I, I I just want to be cognizant of the application before us is the application before us. And we're not the planning board, nor can we make decisions later the planning board. We can certainly provide them with comp with our with our comments um, and input on the proposal. But in so far as we're looking for information specifically related to the conversion of this property from the non-conforming uses to one non-conforming use, I think that's where our our blinders are. So yeah, speak. but you're looking so, at all of 64 comp. And in any as a use capacity, correct? We're not looking at the site. And I value. think you're going to get another use waiver if what I think we can have with that. I, I, I have to take action on what's before the board. And, and I would submit, I think everybody agrees self storage in the building is ready. <laughs> yes, well, I am stating that. I don't think the whole new water board is as it's pushing. So, okay. But I don't want to put words in there. No, no, I've also reached out to the council because I wanted some guidance Martin, from their perspective. Are we allowed to caucus? Not sure. Uh, we, have to, we have to keep our conversations as a forum out in the public. Okay. Yeah. You know, if I may, um, the issue before the board. Oh, do you want to, do you want to introduce yourself so we know? Yeah, for people who join us. Thank you. My name's Tom Burke. I'm the uh, again, and um, I feel like we're getting off into the weeds here a little bit. Uh, the issue for the board tonight, the sole issue, yeah, the exclusive issue, is that uh, the substitution of one non-conforming use for four non-conforming uses. Uh, you have the authority, legislatively granted, you have the power to uh, permit that as long as certain conditions are met. Uh, one of them, the biggest one being less intense use. I think we've clearly demonstrated that. Uh, that's the issue before the board tonight. We have contractual issues. We have lots and lots of uh, deadlines and things that we have to meet. And, uh, you know, we missed the September meeting, something happened and then we had the workshop in October and we're here tonight and, we respectfully request that the board uh, vote tonight on the issue before the board. Everything else is, I don't want to say it's irrelevant, but it's not germane to this discussion. It's a planning question. Um, and, and, you know, the casino may come in and, and they may come to you and seek uh, a variance or whatever they're going to do. We don't know. Uh, truly, we don't know. And we don't represent them. Uh, and if and when they, they appear before this board, they'll have to make their case if they choose to do that, if they move forward. And as far as the property out front goes, it's a separate legal lot. So it's, it's not segmentation, it's a different piece of property. Tax ID number and, and <laughs> section block and lot number is, is different. So nobody's trying to trick anybody, nobody's pulling the wool over anybody's eyes, nobody's trying to fool anybody. We just don't want to be delayed any further. And, uh, we think we've got a great adaptive reuse here, and we respectfully request that you grant the relief that we are seeking tonight. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thomas Burke. Okay, I didn't hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I guess I was saying we should wait for the Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association letter in writing, but I guess um, Mr. O'Brien read it into the record, so does it count as record enough? We did receive some communication for that. I have a motion. I move that we approve the request to allow for the substitution of four prior legal non forming non conforming uses with a different non conforming use. First of all, uh, yep, for self storage for 64 Carlton Avenue. Yes. And uh, with uh, 
develop and review the next step in that process. I will wire that out in the, the decision. Sorry, do we have a second? I'll second that, Mario. Okay, great. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you all. Uh, we'll give, just just give uh, two minutes. We'll change gears and we'll go into our workshop agenda. Um, with that, a motion to close the public hearing portion of the meeting. We're still gonna don't don't change the channel. <laughs> but, uh, we'll close out the public hearing portion. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn public hearing. I move, I move that we adjourn the public hearing. Okay. okay. So we have a second for adjourning the public hearing. We have a second. On favor, aye. 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 Uh, so for record the minutes, the public hearing portion of the agenda is closed out. of our agenda. I'm going to hand it over to Avi to, uh, to our screen share. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, public workshop on the agenda is an opportunity uh, for the board to discuss cases and applications. Um, there may be... Okay. Uh, uh, typically, the types of things are uh, making sure that we have a, a complete application for the board. So if we go to public hearing, we have all the information uh, at our fingertips to be able to make uh, an expedited decision if necessary. And also, uh, so when we post materials, the public has a good expectation, expectation about the meets and bounds of a particular application before the board. So they are well informed and able to make um, their comments on a particular application. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to staff to walk us through a series of applications uh, for assigned finances. Thank you. Um, so our first uh, application for the workshop is project number 485, and this is for the property located at 80 State Street, applicant is Tax and Sign Corporation. Uh, it's in the MU DT, which is the mixed use downtown zoning district. It's also within the historic resources overlay. Um, so we have that staff look at the look at the sign for compliance with that as well. The proposal is to install a new channel lettering on the side of the building. The total sign size is 24.21 square feet. Uh, so the specific request before us is for area variance number. 111, uh, this is from table 375.409.1 to allow for a fourth wall sign where a maximum permitted is one per street frontage. Um, so here I just have the overview on the left-hand side. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but the property is on the corner, South Pearl and State, and it's highlighted in red. Um, and the sign is being proposed on the, on the left-hand side here, so it's really Facing South Pearl. Facing South Pearl. Yep. This is MT. Yeah. So yeah. You'll, you'll see it right over here. So on the corner, um, again, basically right next to where the, the MT bank is. Then this is um, a more recent photo. I think it's from the middle of this year. Um, and you can kind of see where there, there used to be a sign actually uh, in between those two where the MT and Morgan Stanley is. Okay. This, although a little hard to see here, this is the sign rendering um, as provided. So it'll be, let me just move this. Yep. So and there you can see the sign um, and that's being proposed. Again, it's a little hard to see, but it's just to the right of where the MT Bank sign is. 
Um, in terms of the size of this compliance, it's more a question <clears throat> about the number because it's one per street frontage um, or shop fronts. In this case, it doesn't really have a shop front. Um, and there are, as we can see, three existing side signs on that on that side of the building. Um, here, just for reference, is the um, section of the ordinance. So, and, and this will be relevant for the other uh, applications as well. And just a general overview that everyone's aware of the five criteria for the area variants. Um, and so, I, I won't go reading through each one uh, completely, but essentially. To summarize these, the character of the neighborhood, um, you know, the applicants noting that there are uh, a lot of buildings in this area that have multiple signs specifically for their, their tenants. Not every single tenant has one, but a lot of the buildings, including this one, um, do. Any alternatives that were considered, um, is essentially there's not many other ways to provide a sign or signage without seeking this variance to have it on there. Um, I don't think it's realistic to say that they should have a different spot in the building. I think they- Because they'd still need a variance. Right. Um, so really, no matter no matter which way we cut it, they would they need a variance in order to have signage. Um, substantiality, it's, it's under the 32 square feet. Um, so it's not that they're requesting, you know, exceptionally large sign or six different signs you know, specific to the one that they're requesting. Um, now, do we see this total square footage as the combined square footage of all the signs together, or are we looking at each sign as the square footage? This is based on the square footage of each individual sign. As the, as the code has it, it's based on each sign and not the total. <laughs> okay. So we're looking at whether the sign is at a character with the permitted sign size, mm -hmm. being that the application is a variance for an additional sign and the totality of the two signs. Yep. Okay. You summed it up better than I did. I, I'm surprised I spit that out the way I did. Avi, <laughs> real quick on that one, it, it said, can you go back? I'm sorry. Yep. So it's part of this that there would be one sign. I guess I'm confused. It said there's more signs in the loud and one removed, so we'd be allowing four. So yeah. is there a sign being, I guess, I guess there's a lot of uh, <laughs> sign requests tonight, so just stay with yeah. me for a second. That's, that's um, a good sign. Yeah, so there was the one that was removed there, and then um, this would bring it back to the total of four. So it's not, there had previously been a sign there and another sign to the right of Morgan Stanley. Okay. So they're, they're essentially those signs have already been taken down, and this would be going back in the spot of one of them. So, yeah, and I thank you for that. So, hey, looks like there was formula formally a sign on both the state and south pearl corners but we are the, the application is just for one etc correct that, correct okay yep. yeah we can just we can just ask the applicant to um kind of clarify that in their in their response yeah. to the public hearing thank you yeah. oh, wait um, oh, sorry substitution stuff um because I guess I didn't catch everything you just said, Martin. Mm -hmm. like, but because I don't know that the square footage matters here, right? Like that's, the, that's what you were saying? I, I was saying because the, the permitted sign is within the allowable square footage if it was the only sign allowed, okay. right? Yeah. If, if, it, if it was the only sign up there, there wouldn't be here. But we're really looking at it's in addition to the other signs making yeah. it non -compliant. So it's really like the substantiality, I think, is instead of the one allowed there's it's four, it's four. i yeah. mean they're only asking to add one more but there's already correct so, yes. I mean, yeah. instead of the one allowed they're asking to have four it is substantially speaks specifically to the numbers is that yeah. what the variance is for however i think it's important to take in the, the overall context as well right um, to exactly. differentiate it from other applications yes yeah. but at the same time it's not like we've got a a 1,000 square foot sign, just keep it to the four. That the, the sign is legally compliant, if not for the other signs. Uh, for impact on the environment, um, you know, they've noted it would not, <clears throat> it would not have an issue on traffic circulation. Um, it made a statement that it um, 
could improve visibility and, and you know traffic related matters. And then just noting specifically that there's no um, no negative impacts related to dust, noise, or odor. Um, you know, and not not an effect on drainage or other public services as we, we typically don't see with with signs. Mm -hmm. um, no lighting. This is like. Um, I don't believe this is lit. I'm just double check. Yeah, it's, it's, is this one that channel lighting? Yes. Yeah. Oh, set of LED internally illuminated. Yeah. I guess for the record, just to disclose, um, my mom's last name is Dykeman, but it's spelled differently. And I have no relation to the applicant. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt. Noted. It's not my mom. <laughs> uh, as far as self-created difficulties, right. the applicant's statement is it is a self-created um, difficulty. I like this response. <laughs> yeah. Very honest. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, that's all I have on on this. I don't know if there's any questions or if there's any questions for the applicant while they're here. I don't have any, any questions at all. So the extra signs that currently exist were they allowed or? Oh. Those, as far as I can tell, three days. I, I think specifically the M and T ones. As far as I can tell, and the Morgan Stanley predated the current USDO. Um, it's a little tricky for me to find out exactly when some of those went up. And I didn't, I think there was also a different permitting system at the time. It's kind of hard to track down. Yeah, um, can, can address that. I think. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah, I can see if the applicant knows that. Um, right. Do you know that the PKS did require permitting, special permitting? Okay. No, uh -huh. more signs as well. I don't know about the others, but I do know also historically there were IBM signs on the corners, and there's been multiple signs in that building for most of its duration. Yeah, and the the large the larger rendering that's submitted in the application on the left hand side, you can actually see where the old IBM signs were, um, more or less on the the third. Um, sign band there. <laughs> Is there anything else on this one? It may also be helpful to know whether they, the applicant plans to have the sign lighted for 24 hours or for a limited amount of time. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so um, thank you, uh, Darren. I'll, I'll get back to you with the um, the comments we have here, um, and then we'll we'll have you on the agenda for the next public hearing. Yep. All right. We will see everybody at the end of the month. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks for your time. The next application, or just the future, I would say, for for the public for the workshop, just the applicant doesn't have to come. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally worth it. Yep. Just in case people are like, I'm sitting through a hearing first. Yep. Just we'll get them the questions. They can watch. We we actually did we did get that call today from your colleague uh, Christian. I told her it wasn't wasn't required, but so. just yeah. <laughs> um, we we have to be here though. Yeah. <laughs> So the next one is project number 486, um, address is one Sandage Way, uh, applicants AJ Signs. Um, this is in the residential village, the RV zoning district. The proposal is to install two uh, new freestanding signs at the front of the apartment building, and the leasing office. Uh, essentially what we have here is two signs, each of them requiring very similar variances to each. Um, I'll just read those out. So we have area variance number 112, to allow for a 20 square foot freestanding sign where the max permitted is six square feet. Um, the, for that same sign, we have area variance um, 113, which is to allow that sign to be 8.8 feet tall, um, where the maximum height is five feet. For the second sign, we have an area variance 114, that's to allow for a 15 and a half uh, square foot freestanding sign where the max permitted is six. 
And then for that same sign, we have area variance number 115, and this is to allow for a six foot tall freestanding sign where the maximum height is five feet. Um, here is the site location. Again, a little hard to see, but it's it's um, the middle of the buildings fronting on Fuller Road, highlighted in green. These are all part of the same um, apartment complex. Mm -hmm. This building is the one that has the um, the leasing office in it. Uh, and here, same building uh, where the stars are. That's approximately where those um, where those signs will be placed. You can see a little more clearly on the right hand side, and they've also just noted that they'll be in compliance with the corner um, setbacks. Yeah, and that was setback from the side. My first concern when we're looking at a at a variance for these that the site distances won't be an issue. Um, it would be helpful to have some input um, from traffic and engineering as far as vehicle turn movements and visibility at those intersections. Yeah, so I, I can just say like, anecdotally, we we had um, gone out there to do the complete um inspection of the building for construction purposes and the um traffic uh <coughs> engineer was out there as well and we had discussed the signage it was not an issue at that point either um it's adding to the record yep so here are the sign renderings um so you can see on the left hand side the, the larger sign and then the leasing sign on the right hand side um and i will just generally go through these in terms of the character of the neighborhood. Um, this particular property is, is certainly different from the others surrounding it. It's the only one that's zoned in the RV um, residential village within that area. The others are related to the university. So there are larger signs that exist um, in that area. <clears throat> um, Although outside of our ability to regulate. University, we can't. Yeah, we couldn't yeah. tell them this one as long as we wanted to. Yeah. Um, and then, in terms of Fuller Road, it's you know split in some of the different zoning that it has along the street, but it, it does um, certainly see a larger um, degree of traffic, people traveling at a faster speed, um, and you know signage is typically warranted in areas like that. <clears throat> Um, and they have also noted that there's 252 units within the complex, so providing signage is, is important to them um, in terms of making sure that people know where to go or if it's um, people looking to, to rent, that they know where the rental office is. Alternatives considered, um, you know, they've kind of noted there's not really another alternative to provide a sign like this, a freestanding sign that would be visible. Um, to, to people, especially in a more auto-centric type of manner. Um, and in terms of its location or having two signs, it, it, and the applicant doesn't really um, note it here, but you can't really have the same message on both signs without it also being over the size. So kind of different, different ways of um, uh, configuring the sign would still require a variance to some degree uh, you know there could be the possibility of, of limiting the number but it would still require a variance whether for size um <clears throat> or for height yeah because we're always like, oh go ahead, go ahead. You may. And yeah i think what you're saying you know, needs to be fleshed out a little bit like was did they even try to meet the standards and like, to be compliant and in what why and how is it like, not possible right? okay yep. yeah because it doesn't speak to alternatives it just says this is a hardship you yep. it's got to go into the alternatives and we're constrained by law to grant the minimum variance necessary to balance the benefits of the applicant versus the detriment to the neighborhood so we need to be cognizant of that especially for the first variance where the sign is going from six to 20 is quite a substantial jump mm -hmm. so this is an important question that there's no other potential alternative like fleshing out why you need two signs yeah like we can't just assume obviously any signage currently on the buildings 
Do we not that I'm aware of. Okay. Question. But I will I'll confirm. Thank you. And also the final statement signed will distinguish them from other apartments and complex in the area. Isn't that rather unique, that apartment <laughs> complex, that Fuller Road? Yes, and, and in, at least in terms of what's within the city as well, um, because you do have the city city line rather close there. So there's other other properties that they may be referring to that are not within our purview or consideration. Yes, yeah, so I think that that's probably more about branding than that. You know what I think they're getting at here is making sure they're not confused with another building. Mm -hmm. But if it is that, then they should some you know say you know, we we've had many people who cannot find the building to get confused and get lost and go somewhere else things like that. Like I think just making statements without um, yeah, your, yeah. your claim uh, would be would be good. Yep. Okay. Uh, then regarding substantiality. Um, requesting 14 square feet of relief from the maximum allowed and three feet uh, eight inches from relief for, for that one sign and then for the other sign they're requesting 9.5 square feet of relief um, and one foot of relief regarding the height so there's certainly some different levels of um, how substantial it is regarding the specific variances so I would just say that you know, those have to be taken and uh, looked at individually. Impact on the environment, um, it, generally speaking, is, this does not appear to have any major environmental impacts. Um, we'll certainly just clarify in terms of lighting, lighting. Um, and, you know, traffic circulation, just in terms of uh, Martin's point about the um, vision, not, not obscuring anything like that. And then self-created difficulty. Um, you can see the response here, but yes, this would generally be considered self-created difficulty. Any questions? Uh, yeah, not any other than the ones discussed. Okay, so I will uh, get those Nose over for that one. Um, our next project, our next application was for project number 49. This was for property located at 943 Central Avenue, also by um, applicant being AJ Signs. Zoning district for this one is the Mixed Use Community Highway, or MUCH. Proposal is to replace <clears throat> replacement of existing signage with new signs and lettering for the Leah Hyundai according to their corporate branding. Um, they have a request for five variances. They are 116 uh, air variance, 116 to allow for 193.75 square feet. Uh, freestanding sign with a max of 64 square feet. The air variance 117 to allow for a 25 foot tall freestanding sign with a max of 8 feet in height. Air variance uh, 118 which is to allow for two freestanding signs with the maximum number is one for street frontage. Area variance 119 to allow for a 93.59 square foot sign with the maximum permitted is 32 square feet. And finally, area variance 120, which is to allow for three wall signs with the maximum permitted is one. Can, can you, sorry, can you just pause for a yeah. second? Because I think something you, we briefly touched on in the previous one, but I think just hits here is, I, I just want to talk through, but I think, I agree with what you kind of stated, which is when it comes to substantiality, we should be looking at each one of these individually, not the fact that there's five requests. <laughs> you know, like, it, it just seems like a lot when you're reading it right now, mm -hmm. but I, mean, I think we need to look at the criteria for each single request. There, yeah, yeah. It, it's a discrete very experience. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Correct, yeah, and, and you know, the um, motions on them, as you know, are like are done yeah, individually. Um, just in terms of presenting it here, as we were kind of doing earlier, is to have to go through the criteria and everything for each one. At this point, having a slide for them would, 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, quite, quite no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's Next fine to come back on that. I think yeah. we just, I just wanted to make sure. Yep. That was yeah, each, each variance should, should be, each um, answer for or each variance should be addressing that particular component. And maybe, I mean, and I think what I'm getting to is under criteria is the one that changes really was every one of these variants is substantial. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So maybe the applicant when considering the substantiality should look at each request specifically, and not talk about it globally. Yeah. yeah. And again, we're we're hamstrung by the courts to consider the smallest variance necessary. So it's not a, you know, we should be striving for compliance other than just continuing to grandfather things forward. And if you just switch back to, yeah, you know, like, I think for the applicant to consider when preparing for the meeting is, you know, 410119, you know, I guess for those one that, or some of these could be considered fairly small. But then, like the zero one one six, I mean, that's pretty substantial. That is very yeah, like, substantial. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, anyway. Okay. No, I think I understand that. So I'll I'll reiterate that as well when we are um, <laughs> reviewing the applications that come in. Um, here's just a map of the project location. So it's highlighted in green. They they do um, own and operate on the parcel uh, to the left. I think it's. The parking lot. Yeah, the parking lot. I think it's nine forty nine. Um, and there's a sign. There's a separate sign over there, I believe, as well. But um, the ones we're talking about are on that building, and then the freestanding signs that are um, one of them being right next to the um, driveway, the entryway here. And this is just the sign rendering on the building itself. So here we see the three signs. Yeah, facing um, central. So we have the service sign, the Hyundai sign, um, their logo, and then the Leah sign um, on the right hand side. Abby, I have a question. Um, pulling this up on Google Maps, it's when I go to 943, it looks like it's actually behind this building. There's the service um, part of the, yeah, the, the rendering here is a little, it's kind of hard to see. I think they just did it because you wouldn't be able to see the sign. But if you look, here we go. Yeah, if you look at um, okay. service, and let me, yeah, let me move sorry, that. I had a little. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so the service area is set back, you know, considerably from, from the rest of the building. Um, I think that's part of why they want, want that sign there, too. Okay. And so I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify. So we're, this is for the service portion, which is located on 943, as opposed to the dealership, which looks like it's on 945. Um, I don't remember the numbers. Let me just clarify. So, you're saying so that's on the, it might come up differently if you're looking at like Google as opposed to like the official city addresses. Yeah, yeah I guess. With a lot of the car dealerships and parking lots, it gets a little okay. weird because they have different addresses. Um, but yeah, it is 943. Okay. And if you see on the left hand side, it's the it's the part that kind of juts out um, to the left. We're not gonna die in the fire, right? <laughs> I'm hoping not. <laughs> it looks like it just stopped, but I'll keep the door closed. Uh, one one question here when it comes to the site plan, just where's the, where where the sidewalk is? Um, in relation to the pylon and the directional sign, just to get an idea of where the where the sidewalk is. Yep. Okay. I also well, understand the impact on turn movements and impacts on pedestrians who are walking in sight lines. And this is just the close-ups of those various signs with their measurements. Um, the handwritten numbers above them are just corresponding to the permit numbers. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's curious, here are the freestanding signs. So the the one to the right is the, the large one um, that we're talking about. That's the 25 foot tall freestanding sign. <clears throat> and then and is that existing now and it's a new logo? Like there is an existing sign there now, yes. And, and I believe this is in the application, it's the same. Same size, same size, just yeah. a different load. Somebody decided at a corporation to hand them down these requirements. Yes, yeah, and we're, as you'll see with the other ones, we're getting a lot of 
and probably others in the future, we're getting a lot of applications for rebranding of, of uh, auto businesses. Um, so regarding the character of the neighborhood, these, these responses um, that I put in here are from the, some of the different applications, just trying to highlight them all in, all in one, but you know, proposing the three signs where just the one would be permitted. Um, they do talk about the reduction in size or the smaller LIA sign that's um, 6.47 square feet, um, but the prior one was 9.79 square feet. And similarly, for some of the other signs, um, the second paragraph here is regarding the pylon sign, which is the large sign, the existing freestanding sign is 225 square feet. Um, <coughs> part of this is also in, in how we calculate sign area and signage. And it kind of differs a little bit between like a, a wall sign and a, and a uh, freestanding sign in terms of what's being considered as part of the sign. Um, but you know, generally speaking, in terms of the character of the neighborhood, they, they did supply photos of some of the adjacent um, surrounding properties. Um, so they're included in the application as well, just kind of showing that it's not particularly out of character with the other businesses, um, especially the other auto auto businesses in this in this area, and specifically within the zoning district. And you know, like I think uh, Martin kind of said that, but. You know, we've we've had other variances for signs on Central Avenue, and I, I do always come back to the fact that the USDO knew what Central Avenue looks like, and it's still main design requirements what they are. Yeah. And so, if we keep every time granting variances, you sure. make the signs bigger, and because the other signs are bigger, then well, nothing will ever. We're undercutting the USDO. Right. I mean, no, and like we're not the legislature. Yeah, all I can say to that is you, you still just keep applying the same the same standards. And if if it happens to be that you keep granting the variances because they meet, you know, the majority of those standards, then that's just what happens to be. That that's assigned to us as staff, and that's you know the signal to the common council that the code should be amended. Um, for the alternatives considered, um, they, they kind of just note here that. They say there's no other means by which to maintain the same level of visibility to motorists. Um, and I guess I would I would note um, it'd be difficult to differentiate between some of the differing uses within the building, kind of like the service area to the general um, area where, where people are going in. Their um, direction. Sidewalk, yeah. Say, yeah. So that, that definitely is hard to do with just one sign. Um, but I think to the points made earlier, they could provide a little more um, context to that in here. And to the to the pylon sign and to any other brands that are required as part of an agreement, that should be part of the application. If, it's, if, if we don't have control over the requirement being passed upon to us, it's not exactly a non self created hardship, but it speaks to that. So those are elements that would supplement the application and be part of the record that I would think would make the applicant's case stronger. Okay. And like really saying to that point, right? Like, so did you consider it like so you got your your corporation standards signs? Yeah. yeah. It's hard to make it. Was there yeah. any like can you state or otherwise, yeah, you know, did you consider like those are the only signs that meet your corporation requirements? Mm -hmm. Or were there potentially other signs that met those? And if so, why did you not consider those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I can ignore the, the part that says sign height there, but substantiality, um, again, differs differs from each, each one. Some of them, uh, I think it's not so substantial and others are, are quite a substantial deviation from the code. Um, so I'll just kind of reiterate that to the applicant to, to highlight that within their, um, in their application for the public hearing. Or any other notes on those? No. I mean, I think that, you know, the, what's done here a little bit is, which is good, is like, to some extent, I guess, it's saying where they are doing less than what currently is. Yep. I guess, I mean, even though it's still not meeting the standards, I guess it's getting closer to the USDO standards. So I think that's a good point to make where it, it's applicable. Okay. 
Yeah, so if it's a reduction, just, just showing what that reduction is. Uh, impact on the environment, just like the others, um, you know, they're, they're replacing the replacements of other existing signs for the most part. Um, you know, we'll, we'll just confirm that there's no impact on the traffic circulation, but um, generally it's not the case as long as it's meeting, you know, those, those setbacks and mm -hmm. visual elements. And then there's not, um, there's no impact regarding the dust, noise, odor, or other public services. Um, and lighting is in, in, um, in compliance with what the code specifies. So created difficulty, um, like all the others, this, these would generally be considered a self-created difficulty. I think to Martin's point there, you could submit um, some information that could help to potentially address that or, or you know. Yeah, I, I, I can certainly, uh, I don't know, empathize is the right word, but you know, car dealerships are franchises and you get somebody that comes down and says, you have to have a sign to maintain your franchise. If that's the, if that's the, the, um, the requirement or the, you know, the dictation from the mothership and you have to comply, then put that in the record. Right. Any questions on this? All right, move on to, I kind of lost count, I believe it's the last one. <laughs> Say that. Application, uh, well, project number 490, uh, property address 1383 Washington Avenue, applicant BJ Signs, Zoning District, Mixed Use Community Urban, MUCU. Uh, proposal is the replacement of existing signage with new signs and lettering for the Fairfield by Marriott according to the corporate branding. Um, the request specifically is for two area variances, uh, one of them being uh, number 121 to allow for two wall signs with a maximum permitted is one. Uh, I'll just note that there's already, you know, there's already a current sign there. So the one that they're requesting is the second. Um, and then area variance number 122 is to allow for that same sign to be 72 square feet with a maximum permitted is 32 square feet. Um, here is the sign rendering um, on the building. So kind of as we're looking at it on the top image, it's facing away from the road, it's facing the parking lot where people would actually be um, exiting their vehicles and entering the facility. Um, you know, and if you look at the bottom, there's already um, a sign up there, and I believe at some point they also had a sign on the um, the canopy area there as well. But just working with the applicants, when they had requested a sign from there and that was denied, they did agree just to remove their request for that variance. So they did reduce the number that they were originally requesting. Um, so it's just this one here, and then there is currently a sign on the essentially what would be on the left hand side of the, the front image that faces the street. Is it just me or does the square footage of the sign look like the proposed is less than what's existing? It certainly does look like that. And so, yeah, that may be a, so a different font says in here or not. It doesn't yeah. tack on, so. Um, character of the neighborhood. Um, the hotel has an existing wall sign that faces the parking lot as we can see. Um, it's not dissimilar to other businesses like this in that area, um, whether hotels or, or other general businesses or um, residential accommodations um, generally have larger and more, more than one sign um, in, in that area. Alternatives considered, um, there's, no, there's no, no other means to indicate the hotel's entrance other than another sign. Um, you know, to your point, there are two variances here. One is for the second, for the number of signs. Mm -hmm. So I think that that applies more there. In terms of the square footage, a 32 square foot sign, this instance would not be visible and legible at the height that's necessary for this location. I, I think they make a good point here in terms of um, it, it would be considerably smaller in that area. I don't know it's that it's, you know, something that would be as easily seen or called out. Um, and yeah, it looks cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Substantiality, uh, again, ignore the, the sign right there. Um, 
Applicant just notes they don't believe the additional wall sign at 72 square feet should be seen as substantial. Um, it's above the third story of the building, or it's really kind of at the third story of the building. And um, the size of the, the, the differential in size, um, I think numerically is, is substantial. Um, but I think if we kind of look at the general context of the building, there's potentially an argument to be made there. Um, in terms of the number of signs, you know, it's, it's a doubling from one sign permitted to, to having two. Um, you know, I guess one thing we could consider though is it's not a second sign on the same side of the building. It's one facing more where, um, where there is not or will not be a, a second sign. Uh, impact on the environment, similar to, to all the others, um, there's no no noted impacts, um, and in this case, even less so on any potential visual um, uh, impairment to, to drivers or anything like that, since it's not facing the street. Um, Self-created difficulty, I'd say it's pretty much the same as we've kind of moved to the other one where this is, you know, corporate branding. Um, mandate's the right word, but, you know, requests on, on their behalf, um, although generally I would say it's still falls into the self-created difficulty, but that doesn't, uh, for, for all of these area variances, just the fact that something is a self-created difficulty doesn't preclude it from Correct. obtaining the area variance. Not this positive, as Richard used to say. Yes. Um, that is all. I don't know if there's any questions on this last one. Uh, just, you know, same thing as the other ones for lighting and environmental impact. And, um, and I think on the fact um, I think it can be more fleshed out the fact that it needs to be seen from Washington Avenue that just from the parking lot because that building is so set back. Right? We can, I believe it's like the building and the parking lot at Washington Avenue. So I think that could be expanded on for this specific application. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll you have, have those notes, but we'll just make sure everything was. Um, provided to the applicants. That's, that's all for the items I have in the public workshop. Um, we do close this. I do just have a couple things I'd like to discuss internally. Mm -hmm. That's okay with everyone? Okay. That all just close the public workshop. Do we need to make a motion? No, we're not, we're not public hearing. Yeah, we don't need a quorum for a workshop. Let me just... Uh, better when we get somebody to